I remember we kind of faced this conundrum where, you know, I, I, I was, you know, investment banker working with Arch and Timor. We knew tech was taking over everything. We knew we wanted to start something in the future and we had to have a diversity of skill sets. So they decided to be software engineers. I realized that wasn't for me. So I learned, I decided to do sales and I think you decided to do the same thing. So can you tell people how you, you know, started in your first job? Yeah, so uh, the first job, look, coming out of a liberal arts college in 1983, <laughs> um, uh, unless you were, you know, unless you knew the profession, if you're going to a real estate or finance or, you know, going to Wall Street, one of those things, or consulting firms, I was clueless. Mm -hmm. But I knew that um, I needed to be self-sufficient, and the best way for me to be self-sufficient was to depend on my own abilities, which meant sales. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I went looking for sales jobs, and then unfortunately, at the same time I was graduating, my mother was uh, getting divorced, and so I was knew that you know that I was going to be more out on my own than mm -hmm. I originally planned, mm -hmm. and you know that was fine. It just was unexpected at the time. So I took a job that paid more, and the job that paid the most was $18,000 a year, wow. going to work for a great company called Pitney Bowes Dictaphone, who was selling this new technology, speaking about technology back in 83, <laughs> called word processing. Okay. And you're all too young that are listening to this to know that word processing used to be a machine, not a software package. <laughs> and um, you would go into these companies if you were selling them, and you'd literally go Elevator to elevator, door to door, office to office to convince them that they needed word processing. <laughs> so I was very excited. I was told my first day that I got the highest uh, score on the exam that they'd given people and I was ready to go and I thought I was going to make money. And then they said, uh, sit down, have bagels, meet everybody, enjoy yourself. Two hours, we have a company-wide meeting. And I went up to the company-wide meeting and they announced that Pitney Bowes Dictaphone was going out of the word processing business. <laughs> and then I and 998 of my other fellow employees were wow. being laid off. Wow. wow. But it shows how serendipity things are because mm -hmm. the company that I didn't take that I actually wanted to work for, but it paid less at the time and I thought mm -hmm. I needed more money. So it's a good lesson for me. Mm -hmm was a company called Ziff Davis mm -hmm. Publishing Company, uh, founded by, uh, I think, one of the greatest publishers of all time, Bill Ziff. Mm -hmm. And they really helped create the whole concept of special interest publishing, like your podcast yeah. mm -hmm. is special interest publishing. But they were flying, boating, running, uh, uh, skier, mm -hmm. skiing, road and track, you know, all these kinds of things. Psychology Today, Stereo yeah. Review, for any of you mm -hmm. who know what a stereo is. Yeah. They didn't name them Alexa at the time, but stereos <laughs> used to play music. So I had interviewed there and gotten a job in, in ad sales. Mm -hmm. And I was gonna be classified ad sales to all these really cool magazines at the time that all my friends knew, and so that's a pretty cool thing. And I went in, two weeks later, I called them up the day I got let go, and they said, absolutely want you, you were, we were disappointed when you didn't say yes, come on in, when can you start? And I mm -hmm. said, well, very busy guy, I could start in two <laughs> weeks, because I took my severance pay and I went to trip to Europe. Wow, yeah. that's uh, smart. <laughs> yeah, well, I went to Europe and came back, and I couldn't wait to start my new job in classified advertising for all these amazing consumer magazines. And I walk in the door, and I'm, I'm told, I asked for the people that interviewed me, and they said, well, I got good news and bad news. Mm -hmm. The bad news is none of those people work on these magazines anymore. Dang. The good news is they all still work at the company, and they're in a new division called the uh, Creative Computing Magazine Division, and so you need to go find them. So I walk in and all the people that had hired me to do classified advertising were now in the circulation department of a new division for computer magazines. Wow. So instead of selling advertising, I was literally, my first job was taking the yellow pages and looking up and finding small mom and pop computer retail stores. This is mm -hmm. before there was any of the super stores. Mm -hmm. And convincing them to carry 10 magazines for resale. And that they could make 35 bucks a week if they did. Wow. <laughs> so that's what my college education went for. Yeah. But the lesson for me, again, was things are never mm -hmm. what you expect them to be. You have to be able to adapt to the situation. You have to have a good attitude. And you have to succeed. Mm -hmm. And... So it started that way, but it turned out to be the most fortunate thing that's ever happened to me in my life professionally because computers became big. Yep. I continued to work my way up through the company, and 15 years later, I went from the telemarketer to the CEO of the internet division mm -hmm. wow. when no one even knew there was an internet until the 1990s. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. so the world keeps evolving. You got to stay in the game, you got to stay focused, you got to keep performing, you have, a have to have a good attitude. And if you think you can structure 
Mm. Your life and your choices, it's the old famous Mike Tyson quote, which is we all have a plan until we get punched in the face. And, yep, yep. and I got punched in the face two times in two weeks, and it's turned out pretty darn great for me. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, and then you also grew up in, in New York. So can you kind of talk about, like, how that affected just, like, kind of like your mindset and your upbringing? I know you talked a little bit about your family, but how did that shape, you know, what you were doing? Well, family shapes you all the time, good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, and you know you learn the value set from your family and and what I'd always learned was education mattered mm -hmm. and my mom was a public school teacher and so were uh, many of my aunts and uncles mm -hmm. uh, my father had left when I was a young age so I also learned the dependence of the greater family grandfathers and grandmothers in particular mm -hmm. um, but I also learned that there's a lot of things I'm gonna have to do on my own yeah mm -hmm. New York which you know, I live both in New York and in California. New York is like no other place on the planet. And mm -hmm. um, I think it prepares you to compete and to challenge yourself and to grow. Um, and Silicon Valley allows you to think outside the box and outside the norm. Mm -hmm. So growing up in New York, it was always if I took a job, how do I do it 10% better? And how do I stay at a company and work my way up the whole time? And you have to go through this, this mm -hmm. uh, structure. Yeah. Whereas in Silicon Valley, when I met people like Jerry Yang and David mm -hmm. Filo, the founders of Yahoo and Jeff Mallet, mm -hmm. and they didn't ask, uh, how did the person do the job before me? They said, what needs to be done and what's the most efficient way to do it? Yeah. And I was like, huh, it's a completely different <laughs> way of thinking. So the balance between the competitiveness and the challenge and the speed um, and, the, and the diversity of New York combined with the creative and new way of thinking and the importance of technology of Silicon Valley and really the importance of turning young people loose, yeah. which Silicon Valley is very famous for, putting those three things together I think is a, is a much more complete picture and has allowed me um, to stay relevant even at 57 years old. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And how do you see, so you've brought up technology and how it's changing industries, but specifically in education, which is the industry you guys are in, and you have mentioned that you guys are putting customers first, where traditionally in the education system it was the schools or the publishers. So how do you see technology changing the way uh, students are prioritized by companies and the system, and where do you see that going in the next five years? Fantastic question. And, and the truth is, when we said student first, which was almost mm -hmm. eight and a half years ago, mm -hmm. which I put on the bottom of an email sort of randomly, mm -hmm. because once we started doing textbook rental and once students started to write in and say, if not for Chegg, I never would have gotten textbooks. If not for Chegg, mm -hmm. I, couldn't have take, I couldn't have taken two courses. I'm only mm -hmm. taking one. Yeah. So we have so many community college kids. I realized that our job is to put the student first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Chegg had an IPO uh, almost five years ago, four and a half years ago, that didn't go particularly well. We did, we priced at 12.50, first trade was 11.25, first day closed at 9.68. So you wanna talk about humbling? I could talk about humbling all day long. Um, and doing that on CNBC and in front of my daughters and my wife is not my finest um, <laughs> proud moment. But the stock dropping all the way to $3.15, people didn't think that they needed to change. Mm -hmm. Now that the stock is over 30 mm -hmm. and that the Chegg reaches um, you know, nearly half of every college student and 25% of them we believe by the end of this year will be a paying customer mm -hmm. and that they use our learning services at le on average once a week and they're consuming over 200 pages a semester, mm -hmm. people are beginning to wake up to the fact mm -hmm. that the system is not designed to serve the modern day student. And the modern day student is actually 25, not, mm -hmm. not um, 18 to 22. 25% 25 of students actually have a child already. Mm -hmm. They're working. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether it's four year or two year. And fewer and fewer are going to residential colleges because of the time and the money. Even if you went to a community college, it's an hour commute there, an hour commute back, 50 minutes or an hour for the class as three hours out of your day yeah. to, mm -hmm. to learn one thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the, I think the impact of, of Chegg's success on the industry has been to show that if you make the content and the information mm -hmm. available, affordable, personalizable, and adjustable to the way the student actually wants to learn with multiple modalities, mm -hmm. video, text, mm -hmm. human help, mm -hmm. we don't choose for you. We don't assume one is better for you. 
We assume that you may need all the different kinds depending on what you're studying. Yep. And the fact is the majority of our studying happens after nine o'clock at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from our standpoint, we think that technology should have already had a much greater impact mm -hmm. yeah. because it's difficult to do anything at scale in mm -hmm. an individual school, mm -hmm. but technology allows you to do so. It allows you to make content available all hours, not just the schedule hours. Yeah. It makes, uh, it gives you the ability, we do online tutoring, we have hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of tutoring sessions for as little as 50 cents a minute. Yeah. Most of those things are at midnight, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because people work, they have lives, they have families. And so I think the impact is schools are gonna need to adjust to utilizing technology to the advantage of their student mm -hmm. base. And when they do, their student base will expand, they'll learn more, They'll be able to take greater amounts of curriculum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you go to a residential college, 95% of the time at the college is not in a classroom. Yeah. There seems to be a lot more learning that people can do. Yeah. And, and our view is like Netflix. If you can binge watch my favorite show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then I ought to be able to binge learn my education. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for four years or two years. Yeah. Totally. If yeah. I'm willing to put in the time and the effort and the energy and I can master the concept, why can't I go be LeBron of the workplace and just yeah. go right from right to the yeah. job? Exactly. I think it's also important to, to highlight team. We talked about team, you know, got Mark in the room, got other people in the room. How did you go about choosing your team? How did you build your team? What do you look for when you hire people? You know, it, it's first of all, I'm very fortunate because at the level that I'm at, mm -hmm. anybody that I get to interview has already had success and already has skills. So what do we look for? We look for chemistry. We look for attitude. We look for people who believe that success is a result of what we collectively do, not what an individual does. So I have been so fortunate that my team mm -hmm. has fundamentally stayed together for the entire eight years that I've been out here. Wow. So I've had people work with me over three jobs in more than 10 years, wow. and I've had um, I've had my banker, who was a junior banker when I took the job, then went back to business school, took us public, and then joined us. Nice. Right? So, so my management team has been here almost as long, or in some cases a little bit longer than I've been here, and we've stayed together. And what we learn is nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to be great at everything. Yep. But if we believe in each other, if we trust each other, if we communicate with each other and we let the people that are supposed to do what they're supposed to do, the way they're capable of doing it, not the way I'd like to see them do it. Yeah. Because the way my lens is very different than the people that work for me lens. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have that level of communication and that level of dialogue and that level of trust, mm -hmm. and they believe that, the, that we're gonna work to get the best out of them, and they're trying every day to get the best out of this company, it tends to work. And yeah. so every great, everybody that wins, rarely wins based on themselves even in individual sports mm -hmm. you always hear whether it's a gymnast or whether it's a tennis player or whether it's a race car driver you always hear them thank their team yeah because mm -hmm. somebody coached them somebody yeah. practiced with them somebody yeah. taught them something somebody read them the riot act when they needed to have it read to them yeah every one of us succeeds as a result of a lot of people who play a critical role through many parts of our lives